Well, hello, everyone. I would, like to, I would like to welcome all of you to today's online program taking place here at the IBF. My name is Anish Jan, your host and moderator for today's complimentary webinar. For your reference point, I speak to you from just outside of New York City, USA. Well, we're very pleased to have another exciting and valuable webinar with IBF's 2012 Excellence Award winner, Patrick Bauer, who we're also fortunate to have as a distinguished speaker at the ASCM or APEX and IBF's Best of the Best SNOP conference taking place in Chicago, June 13th and 14th next month. Regarding the upcoming conference in June, this will be APEX and IBF's 12th year leading our annual Best of the Best SNOP conference. Yes, folks, 12 years. And once again, we feel we have an excellent agenda and speaker lineup to drive discussion and debate in SNOP and in integrated business planning. Our keynote is the Vice President of Supply Chain from L'Oreal, Anish Bush, who will be sharing his vast planning experience at the event. So hopefully, we'll get a chance to meet all of you in person next month in June. Now, especially with those of you that are new to both organizations, I just want to quickly share a little bit about both of us. First, ASCM. ASCM, or APEX, is a premier professional association for supply chain and operations management and the leading provider of, the, of education and certification programs that elevate supply chain excellence. They are known for designation CPIM, Certified in Production and Inventory Management, as well as CSCP, Certified Supply Chain Professional. On IBF, IBF's mission is to foster the growth of demand planning, forecasting, SNOP, and the careers of those in the field. We're recognized worldwide as providers of demand planning, forecasting, analytics, SNOP education, e-learning, benchmarking research, uh, on-site corporate training, certification, and corporate advisory. Our certification designations are CPF, Certified Professional Forecaster, and ACPF, the advanced version of the CPF certification. We've been doing this for well over 30 years now. The IBF wants to build credibility for demand planning, forecasting, advanced analytics, and SNOP within organizations and further legitimize the field. And not only do we do this via certification and research, but through our global events and with our flagship publication, the Journal of Business Forecasting, otherwise known as the JBF. And our spring issue was just released where you can read Patrick Bauer's latest article on customer service and SNOP. So please contact us if you would like more information on all the great things that IBF does to support the field of planning and forecasting. And of course, contact ASCM for anything related to su supply chain management. Well, again, the title of today's talk is Fed Up of Nasty Surprises, Mitigating Risk with Scenario Planning. Pat will be sharing how to look into the future Scenario planning and dynamic simulation look at changes in key drivers that impact supply, demand, inventory, and other variables. In other words, as said earlier, looking into the future. Pat will share in the allotted time what tools and methodologies are needed, as well as how to develop playbooks. A little bit about Pat. Patrick Bauer is currently Senior Director of Global Supply Chain Planning and Customer Service at Com. He has a wide area of expertise, including SNOP, demand planning, inventory, network optimization, and production scheduling. A recognized expert on demand planning and SNOP, and a self-professed SNOP geek. And if you come to the conference, do ask him why he's an SNOP geek, not an SNOP nerd. Yes, folks, there is a difference, and Pat will entertain you with a lively dialogue on the difference. Sorry, Pat, I couldn't help that. Also, Pat Patrick has spent time in consulting as well as as a practitioner or user. His experience includes companies like Diageo, Bayer, Glaxo, Smith Klein, Pfizer, and more. And he's had 10 years at companies like Cadbury, Kraft Foods, Unisys, and Snapple. Now, before I hand it off to Pat, I have a few reminders for today's webinar, which are no different from previous IBF webinars. We, we request that all of you ask your questions in the questions box located at the bottom of the GoToMeeting panel. Q&A is a big part of our live webinars, so this is highly encouraged. You can start asking questions at any time. Then at the conclusion of the presentation, we'll open it up for Q&A to address these questions as best as we can with the time remaining. This should take place about 10 minutes before the hour. Finally, to receive the slides for today's presentation, there will be a short evaluation survey at the conclusion of the webinar that you'll receive via email. 
We request that everyone completes this short form. This is extremely important for our continuous improvement. We've been providing our webinars complimentary for some time. Therefore, this is our only request from you. Short survey will equal a copy of the slides. So without further ado, at this time, I want to introduce all of you to Mr. Patrick Bauer. Pat, take it away. Uh, thanks, Anish. Uh, forgive me, I have a little bronchitis, so my voice is uh, a little gravelly today. Um, I'm going to start off by talking by, by talking about uh, known knowns, un known unknowns, and unknown unknowns. Um, forgetting the politics involved with Donald Rumsfeld, this was one of the most interesting quotes I've ever seen out of a politician. And more importantly, someone who's a Secretary of Defense who, who actually has to think forward and look at constantly look at risk. So known knowns are, are things that you can make some reasonable assumptions around, um, such as, such as uh, just changes and differences in demand and supply plans. Then there's known unknowns. You know, that is to say, there are some things that you just don't know about, but you know that there, there are potential problems. And then there's unknown unknowns, those things that you can't reasonably guess what would happen. This is a great quote by Donald Rumsfeld, regardless of the politics. There's a little bit of a preamble. I think we all know that risk exists somewhere in the supply chain. <clears throat> Uncertainty is everywhere. There's uh, demand, monetary, political risk. If you just look at what's happened recently with tariffs, you can understand some of the political risk that, that exists inside the supply chain. Logistics and port congestion is certainly a major issue at different times. Um, regulations, the amount of chemicals that are being banned um, almost weekly, uh, that list just keeps on growing. Weather, uh, you know, both my company and, and many other companies that I know of were impacted by a variety of hurricanes, including Hurricane Maria. As a matter of fact, I had a friend who was going through some chemotherapy and, and they were worried about having enough IV bags uh, to deliver the chemotherapy. And man, that's because one of the leading producers of IV, IV bags was on the island of Puerto Rico. Um, so there's, there's a tremendous amount of risk that we deal with every day. I think every item listed here are items that are part of our, our daily reality. It's funny, going back several, several years ago, um, the IBF did a conference and, one of the, and during one of their leadership sessions, uh, they asked the group, a group of practitioners to outline what the risks are and how they experience them and what they believe them to be. And this was, this was sort of a compilation of all the risks that were decided by a group of about four or five people. Everything from what I've already talked about to port infrastructure and delay issues to climate change. And we don't often think about climate change as sort of a real, a near term risk, but as temperature changes and as crops change and crop delivery changes and things like that, it certainly becomes a risk inside the supply chain. There's also other risks. And, Sustainable resources and the move to more natural or organic can present a risk if you're not positioned to do so. Uh, there's constant competitor dynamics and consumer dynamics also represent a significant risk. Anyone that looks at the recent disruption that's happened on the consumer side of the industry, whether it's the Amazon effect or direct to consumer, uh, direct -to -consumer websites that are being offered by manufacturers, now, there's certainly a lot of disruption. You could even get into sort of some of those niche players that are disrupting individual marketplaces like, like the shaving aisle. Um, certainly Harry's and Dollar Shave Club have done an awful lot to disrupt what's happening inside of that space. There's a, there's a tremendous amount of risk. And, and really addressing some of the things, If when I talk amongst my peers at different conferences, um, we talk about real deal risks. These are the stuff that we face every day. They're not pie in the sky risks. They're not, they're not uh, black swan risks. And a black swan is very rare. So black swan risks are those things that would rarely occur. These are what we deal with nearly every day. And it's part of the life of supply chain leadership. New product failure. New products are failing more than ever before. 
and there's pretty there's a pretty amount of a pretty significant amount of excess and obsolete risk attached to that. You have logistics where where just a change in a measure like an OTIF measure with Walmart or some delivery measure by any other retailer can can cause the capacity to shift from an LTL to a consolidated path and in 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 doing so creates a significant amount of risk. I already talked about political risks risk include including tariffs and how that might impact top line sales as a product imported into a country that now as a tariff might be impacted from a price elasticity perspective. And then there's just naturally occurring disasters. And it seems like every couple of years there's there's a disaster that otherwise impacts our business or impacts other businesses that I know of. I was consulting with a company that got massively impacted by a hurricane that hit in New Orleans because they had a bunch of producing facilities in that region. Uh, tsunamis impacted a bunch of suppliers of, of, of products that were coming out of Japan and that hit, I think, in 2011. So uh, these are the real things that we're dealing with every day. And you know, if you go back to this slide, these are, some of these are a little bit more long reaching and further out and, and a little bit hard to grasp onto what the, what the real risk is, but these are in close risks here. This slide is real deal risks are in close. So how do you manage risk inside of SNOP and and really where does this risk management uh, fall into place? What you really have to do is is help to identify and manage potential and actual risk that that isn't sort of that black swan risk. It's much more of that day in and day out risk. So you want to use SNLP to build guideposts and contingency plans for potential ranged outcomes. Here's, here's plus or minus what I think might happen from a demand perspective. So how does that impact my supply? You want to understand where uncertainty and risk exists and talk about it and talk about it fairly openly. And, and these are sort of in the, in the realm of known unknowns. You know that it, it, it could happen but you just sort of want to work through the probabilities of what might happen. And then you want to proactively anticipate risk. And this is more of scenario planning and building out those models that will help you run different demand and supply scenarios into them so that you have the ability to manage risk. So really depends on where you talk about, uh, how you talk about SNOP is usually two models that people refer to one is more of the stair stair step on the bottom right and the other one is more of the circular model uh, i think people are familiar with, usually with one or the other there's always an executive meeting in each of these uh, both of them talk to demand and demand review and both of them try and balance supply and demand what i've done to try and simplify this is create sort of this discussion around meetings and SNP meetings and the portfolio review, as an example, is a meeting that's at least in one of those two models. And it's a discussion of everything inside of a product life cycle, including new product launches and all the way out to long tail. Demand review is the complete dissection of demand. Supply review is where you get into what ifs of whether you can make it or not. And if you can't, what are the potential options? Pre-SNOP is where you value all of those risks all of those gaps, all of the potential opportunities as well. And the executive review is sort of a line agreement and go. And if you look at the, the progress of the meeting, there's issues, changes, gaps, metrics. All of these give you insight as to whether you have some risk emerging inside of your supply chain. So SNLP actively can actively manage them by surfacing those risks inside of each and every one of these meetings. Moving on to, on to this next slide, I think is probably as instructive of a slide as you can get when you start talking about SNOP. And, and everyone talks about SNOP in, in this highlighted blue box area. They always talk about these five meetings. And there's really the discussion of sort of the integrative approach to SNOP, the much broader scoped version of SNOP. Now, I'm not talking about IBP, I'm talking about 
what everyone knows to be SNLP sort of exists in that blue box. But then you start coming over and there's a commercial planning piece and a commercial strategy and a supply chain planning and a supply chain strategy piece that feeds the SNLP process. So supply chain strategy goes, it starts talking about what is your network? How do I optimize inventory? What's my business continuity plan? What are my scenario plans? What is, what is all my, my optimization modeling look like? What are my guideposts in case an issue happens? And these feed more detailed planning processes, which end up with a rough capacity plan and eventually discussed in the supply review. Similarly, there's a commercial strategy which has product and route to market considerations. And this is where you do all your staging gate exercise and things like that that are product lifecycle oriented, which are feeds into the portfolio review and the demand planning process and ultimately into the demand review. Most people aren't drawing these connections, but there's an awful lot of conversation, especially in supply chain planning around what happens if, how do I manage if, what happens if a production line goes down? Where am I, what's my alternate, alternate sourcing opportunity? And, and this is where you really build the guts of most scenario planning inside of the SNLP process. And because they're connected all the way through the supply review and ultimately to the executive review, there's a plenty of an op opportunity to bring the SNLP, the risk conversation into the SNLP dialogue. So I love this slide. I, I love the fact that this, this little critter, this little mouse has tried to um, assess the risk and he's acting in advance by putting on a helmet. He's willing to go through the time and the trial effort to inform him whether the, whether the decision was a correct one. So I, there's something about this that just sort of struck me right from this conversation. And there's a lot of days where I feel like uh, I didn't wear my helmet to work that day. Pat, can 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 I ask you just to stay closer to the microphone? Sure. Much appreciated. So typical SNOP risk management. Uh, you're going to ask yourself a couple questions. Is the plan right? Is it reality based and banded? Will we be able to produce a plan? And this is where you leverage a rough cut capacity plan for longer range scenario planning. Will the new products be successful? In this case is where you leverage your staging gate portfolio review processes to help manage down risk. The more you, the more you vet and the more you, you dig into what's happening from, uh, with the potential uh, launch in the staging gate process, the better off you have on having your new products be successful. What's your best supply choice when you have multiple options to pick from? Whatever your plan is, are you on track? Because being off track presents risks inside your plan. What happens if, and, and this is where you go through some modeling exercises to determine whether or not you have the ability to meet any demand in any bucket, or what happens if demand exceeds a certain quantity. And are we on budget? Because ultimately businesses are in the business of making money and achieving their budgets and achieving, achieving their strategic objectives financially. So you always have to have that conversation. And this is where you use the SNLP process to test whether you're still at your operating budget. And if not, you have the ability to gap close from there. So an example of an SNLP scenario that really deals with known unknowns that is laid out below. And I call this mismatched numbers. So you have shipment demand for blue widgets that's plus 10 over the last 13 weeks. And you have POS demand of plus three. The difference between these mismatches between shipments and the point of sale demand is about seven percentage points, and that seven percentage points could possibly be a trade inventory bill. Your forecast for the next 12 months going forward is plus six. So none of this is making sense. It's not aligning to POS, certainly not aligning to your historical shipment volume. And more importantly, you have capacity currently at 97% with that 6% forecast. So if your shipment is plus 10 um, and that's going to continue, 
then you're probably going to run out of capacity and you have to start asking yourself questions. So again, in sort of the Donald Rumsfeld quote, we have a whole bunch of knowns here. We know what's going on and we have to make decisions around what we know. So what are the risks? Will the trade inventory bill stick or will it row future sales? It's a legitimate question and retailers will build and not build and bleed down trade inventory multiple times during the course of the year. What are the shipments? Uh, why are the shipments outrunning POS? We're missing a fact and it could be that there's a trade inventory build or there could be some other problem, maybe a problem in the data that we don't otherwise know. The POS trend is lower than the budget trend, which poses a budget risk. If the real demand should be a plus three for the balance of the year, you're going to have a 3% shortfall. And if the shipment trend continues, you're going to run out of capacity, standard shifting. So you have to think about subcontracting or limiting or constraining demand to key customers or, or some other way in which to manage that capacity. This is the known, known scenario planning. This is when you have enough facts, you can start making decisions around the facts that you have. This, this takes us sort of into the unknown, the known unknown. So you have some information, but you don't have enough. And I'm going to introduce two concepts, and uh, some of them may be familiar to so a few of you, and some may not. It's really talking about banded forecasts and probability. So we're all used to, to some amount of a banded forecast. Here's a weather map, and I happen to live right above that area called Danbury. Um, but I, we're used to seeing ranged forecasts all the time. And you can see this is a crutch for people that don't want to get it right, but there's inside of a range, there's a degree of uncertainty. So they, they provide you with the range so you have an idea of what you're potentially facing. I think for most people in this case, it's more what you're facing on the upside, because you might make a different decision if you're gonna, about what you're gonna do, if you're gonna go out and buy bread and milk, whether it's four inches or eight inches, eight inches a more problematic um, snowstorm. So we're used to seeing this data. It's very frequent data, as a matter of fact, for us to see. And, and it sort of lines up with historical thinking in SNOP. Now, this is a direct steal, and Dick Link gave me permission to use this because he believes so wholeheartedly that we exist in the demand planning profession with this idea of a myth of one number, that we always talk about getting to a single number forecast. What we really should be doing is thinking in, in a range or a band on either side, upside and downside, relative to the forecast. If you don't do this, you can't scenario plan. If you don't think in ranges, you're not going to be successful managing sort of the known unknowns. I know I'm going to do a certain amount of volume, but it could be plus or minus X percent. And you have to think like this. So you have to start saying, well, if you're serving the retail market, what are my potential listings and delistings on shelf of an existing product? What are the potential uh, distribution gains for any new product I might get? This is where you have sort of those deeper conversations about pluses and minuses around sort of an agreed baseline. And this is part and parcel with SNOP. I think everyone sort of wants everyone to march to that single number. But the reality is, is that the plans you should be, it should be an idea or a concept of a single number around a banded plan. And thank you to Dickling for this great, great slide. So probabilities is the next piece of it. And I'm going to use weather maps because it's something that we're are, we're very that it's very accessible to us. So this is the per percent probability of rain in a given day. So if it's a 30% rain, I may or may not bring an umbrella. But 10% rains are on the border of being being in those areas. I'm probably not. I'm probably not going to think that way. So you're going to take a different action depending on the probability attached to whatever the activity is. And this is no different than demand planning. There's plenty of opportunities, especially on the demand side, that have degrees of probability attached to them. And sometimes, uh, like in a, in a chemical company, they may go through a, a rigorous process of trying to determine probability 
by whether uh, they've introduced the product to a customer, whether the customer has tried it, whether they run it through their product line and, and their manufacturing process to see if it's worked, and whether they've done stability studies on it, and they've done all the things on the back end that allows them to confirm that it's a usable substitute for some ingredient they already have. And they use that progress as a, as a check along the way to try and determine well, whether they have a probability of success. We're used to seeing probabilities in our everyday life, and we should be using them in an SNOP process. So what does that look like? When you're presenting in, in an SNOP process or just in a demand consensus process, you should be looking at something like this. You should be saying, here's my baseline plan. My baseline plan, in this case, I'm saying is $3 million. But there's 1.18 uh, million of upside. And that's all reflected here in those 100% probabilities. Another reason why I probably have not put that in my demand plan is because I don't know the timing or I don't know the pacing of that volume. Or I don't know the, the pipe fill quantities. These are just estimates. These numbers haven't been completely vetted, but certainly probably by the next demand planning cycle, these would otherwise be inside of the demand plan. And then I have some, some ideas. I have a lower probability ideas of, of um, some additional volume that are coming out with another 700,000. And then I, I have some relatively low probability uh, of a downside that I could be potentially delisted where they take us off the shelf at a specific a retailer. You have to work these probabilities and you have to define what rules uh, allow you to put in anything into a demand plan. There's some companies that say if you're 90% certain that you put it inside of your demand plan, if you're 100% certain you put it in your demand plan, and others are fine with 60%. Whatever you do, you should at least from a supply planning perspective take these sort of known unknowns. There's still some uncertainty here. You should take these and put these into your supply chain modeling. So you have the ability to exam, examine whether these are realistic for you and whether you can actually deliver against this volume. If you had constrained capacity where you're, you were constrained at only uh, three and a half million units, you're gonna have a challenge meeting this upside. And that's part of the SNOP process to identify those risks for the upsides as well as for the potential downsides and what that might mean in this case from a budget perspective. So how do you integrate supply into this discussion? There's lots of ways in which you can introduce supply. And this slide sort of has, has an example of a new product launch with potential volumes and there's sort of high and mid and low and the bottom is sort of a, the worst case scenario. Um, that's sort of the worst possible outcome you can get. It's funny, I, when I was at Snapple, we took every new product launch going back that I could find data on going back 10 years and we modeled it and we lined them all up. And what we found is when, it, when a new product tracked along a certain line from either a POS or from a shipment perspective, it was doomed to failure. So we were able to learn from that and make early calls based on the volume. Those early calls allowed us to avoid obsolete expense, and allowed us to exit the market and come in quickly with an alternative new item so that we can plan accordingly. It was a tremendous, it was a tremendous um, nugget of information. We also found out that sort of as we tracked along this upper line, there were times when it really jumped off the page and it would be up here. It would be 20 or 30% more. So anytime we felt like we were tracking along a high line, we, we started looking at our capacity and whether we can meet the capacity and whether we'd otherwise be burdened if we didn't. So modeling what, what historical expectations have been and when you're putting together a new product plan, looking at how that models out, what are the potential opportunities, you could turn that into uh, a demand plan and a resultant supply plan from there. Again, this is where you scenario plan 
inside the heart of SNLP. This is this is SNLP 101. It's not really extended SNLP. So this is an example that I use. I just sort of talked about, and what happens if you really grow in the bottom in the bottom graph? What happens if you really go out of control to your expectations? And how do you set the targets? And what are the limits? And can my suppliers know in advance? And that's just for any new product forecast. Certain that you create this extreme outlier, at least on the supply side of it, you, you determine whether you can meet that demand or not. And, and you, you predetermine all of those decisions. So you sort of guidepost the reaction. You, you have any ability to sort of lay out the plan or your reaction plan if you sort of really exceed the, the demand expectation. So what is the scenario plan? Most often when people talk about a, a scenario plan, it's, it's usually some sort of supply chain model. It's often a network model of some sort or rough cut capacity plan. It's where you can, where you can change your capacity or you can change your, your demand and get alternate, alternate potential realities. Sometimes you have the ability to determine financial impacts. Usually um, like with a network optimization model, you can see you can see the dollarized impact of going to an alternate source. It allows you to do some preemptive path determination. You can certainly do disaster and risk testing. What happens if I lose a complete plant? Uh, what happens if I lose a warehouse? What, how is that going to impact our business? How am I going to resource it? And use network models. And this is sort of an, just a graphical view of a network. You have suppliers, plants, DCs, and then finally, all the way out to retailers. If you're able to model this, and I, I mean, historically, in some companies I've worked at, we did this in a linear program, um, and we modeled it out completely. So we were able to take a plant offline and see, see how we have to react or how we'd have to project a plant being offline and the inventory we'd have to build in advance or the potential impact it would have on our on our sales uh, if we weren't able to solve the problem in X amount of time. And what company I worked for modeled the potential for a strike at one of their plants and tried to determine how much inventory they would have to pre-build based on a one month strike, a two month strike or a three month strike. So I, I've seen people do all sorts of scenario planning inside of a network model and there's most of the ERP vendors right now have some version of a network modeling tool that would allow you to put them into a scenario, put different inputs into a scenario and, and model and model the potential outcomes. You could also just do a pure rough cut capacity plan where you talk about capacity in, in usually in shifts and you talk about your utilization and how high or low you are. And you can use this to level load but most companies have some ability to, to model their capacity and in doing so, work through scenarios. The rough cut capacity planning for me is the most typically used scenario modeling tool in the supply chain. And it has all different flavors. And this is an example of how someone's taken sort of supply chain planning and supply chain modeling to the nth degree. So you have the output of a rough cut capacity plan on top, and then you have major assumptions and major changes that happened uh, inside, of this, inside the most recent cycle. And then it has decisions that were made, decisions that are still required, identified risks and opportunities, and emerging issues that people think might happen. This is one of those places where, where you sort of combine the best modeling inside of supply chain with the best demand modeling, come up with a strong scenario planning result. How do, you, how do you take everything I just sort of talked about and put it into action? It's really important that, that risk and opportunity slide that I presented, um, that you always speak to that. that. Inside of your SNOP meeting, you're always raising risks and opportunities. Even inside of your consensus meetings or your supply reviews, you talk about risk and opportunity associated with either demand or supply plan. You talk about the probabilities of, of getting new business 
or of the potential to lose business. And you're trying to assign a value to that. You, you have to find a way to model your supply chain. I think if you really want to do the more robust supply chain uh, planning that goes all the way down to managing capacity inside of SNOP, you have to have something resembling a rough cut capacity plan, product family level, um, right level of aggregation. Doesn't have to be, you know, within one percent accuracy. It could be within five to ten percent accuracy, and still give you some guidance. And you have to proactively look for uncertainty in your business. I think we're all very familiar inside the supply chains we manage with those potential demand and supply pinch points that happen, and we can use those to create some out of bounds uh, demands. Try and look at what happens if we really stretch demand high or stretch demand low and see what that does. And then develop a summary document like the document we just saw. Um, so you, you get to sort of elaborate on the rationale and decisions that were taken, the reasoning and trade-offs and all the other considerations. I, I, there's, there's really no magic inside of scenario planning inside of SNOP. It, it's, it's really about thinking about ranges, it's thinking about probabilities, and it's about having a decent supply chain model to bounce your numbers, especially your demand numbers and capacity numbers up against. And then you can use that as a basis for decision making. It, it, when it works, it's magical. And the things that you can test and resolve uh, are pretty amazing. That's all I have for today. There's more content that will be discussed at, at the conference. I love the conferences. If you if you don't go to the conferences, you should uh, find your way there. Um, I like to refer to my, myself a bit as a grizzled veteran. It always harkens uh, an image of, of a steak on a grill. But um, I, I, I always go come out of these conferences, especially the, this joint SNOP uh, conference between ASEM and, and IBF. I always, I always come out of it learning something new. Um, and when a grizzled veteran can go to a conference and learn a few new tricks, Few new metaphors, a way to convey um, uh, some concept or idea internally. It's always beneficial. So thank you for listening. Thank you, Pat, for an excellent uh, presentation. Folks, uh, keep your questions coming in. You can ask your questions in the uh, questions box to, to the bottom right of the GoToMeeting panel. Pat, um, certainly uh, today, it's not a matter of if we will be disrupted, disrupted, or it's it's a matter of uh, when. And uh, I know from our conversations, uh, not 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 dealing with an unplanned event is kind of odd uh, odd today. So uh, you know, this is uh, some great knowledge for mitigating uh, risk. One of the questions that came in, Pat, was on probabilities. You had mentioned in your slides about likelihoods and uh, probabilities. How does your company determine those probabilities? Is there any kind of steps to follow that you can share with the audience? Uh, in some companies, it's gut feel. And I think a little of it's gut feel. Sometimes it's a buyer nodding their head. Um, uh, sometimes it's, it's um, you have the business, but we just haven't determined the number of outlets. Um, so I, it, the variety and mix of how people determine the probabilities vary from business to business. Um, what I've seen be very successful is people make a list of all of the, the uh, salesperson buyer related activities. And as they track along, uh, they, it sort of builds up the probability of success. For example, if they're asking for pricing information and item number information, in a CPG space, that's normally normally a sign that you're probably going to get the business, but you still don't know how large of a business. So, uh, forgive me for using a Walmart as an example. Walmart has I don't know 4,000 outlets. Sometimes you may only get a thousand. Sometimes you may only get two thousand. It's similar for almost every retailer. It's um, I'm not using pick, singling out Walmart as an example. Uh, it, almost every retailer can either give you full distribution, you can be everywhere, or you get partial distribution. And those are some of the things that you don't know. So the, the further the sales cycle progresses, the, 
the more confidence you get in what you propose and the more questions you get back from the buyer and the questions you get back from the buyer, the more confidence you have in, in what's going to happen. I've seen people in the chemical industry go through really very rigorous processes. Like if the customer knows about your product, you have zero probability. If they have actually used your product and put it in a test formulation, your probability goes up to 50%. If they put it through a stability study for, for something that might go, go and touch a consumer's body, um, you probably have a higher percentage. If they've asked you about pricing and volume pricing and, and capacity and availability, your, your probability has gone up more. So I, it's kind of how you go about determining the probabilities is, is specific to the organization, but it's a worthwhile endeavor to go through that exercise. No, it's great. It sounds like it's not an exact, exact science. Nope. But there are some processes there. Um, like most things in demand planning, it's, it's, um, there's a little art inside of the math. And I think there's some art there. For sure. But speaking of probabilities, uh, if some of those probabilities are 100% as listed in, in some of your slides, uh, shouldn't that be worked into the official plan and documented as a basic assumption? Um, yeah. It, question that just uh, came. Uh, eventually, if, if you're, if you're, if you're sure you're going to get the business, and you have you have a lot of confirmed, um, a lot of confirmation, some people will wait. I just put that up as I put those as intentionally fake numbers. So, but there's a lot of people that will say until I get an order, it's not um, it's not demand I want to put in my forecast. And and I, I'm sure there's a lot of people that are not in there saying. That's the way my company works. <laughs> uh, so another question. As a general rule of thumb, when it's a 90% probability, you put in the forecast. Got it. Um, obviously, there are a lot of risks and opportunities in any plan. Uh, how do you determine which one gets uh, elevated and which one takes priority? Well, anything that's, that's business disruptive gets higher priority than, than something that's sort of just a set of mismatched numbers. So what has the greatest um, quantitative impact by, by the profit or, or top line sales, what's ever the real focus of the organization? Uh, again, the prioritization is internal to the company. I think, uh, you know, the pre-SNOP process is the place where you arbitrate and discuss what what those decisions are and what gets elevated to the, to the next level. That's where you talk about those decisions. Great. Um, certainly a lot of folks uh, here and a lot of companies are dealing with shortages to customers. And so a question has come up, what are some of the best ways to handle shortages to customer? Is there anything you can share based on your experience, Pat? Well, I, to be honest with you, I, I'd try and figure out why the shortage was there. Um, it, it's sort of a, going out beyond the scope of this, but I, I think I think pulling in things like Six Sigma concepts and tally sheeting and, and root cause analysis and Fishbone and Ishikawa's and all that, I think those are opportunities to find out the cause of the shortage and then and then run that into um, uh, run that back into your process and figure out where you have a shortfall. So if you're short because you have a really bad forecast, then trying to identify with every major forecast departure uh, why it happened, um, why do you have why was there bad information around it? Um, so if it's a, if it's a fill issue, did you have enough inventory? Did you have correct production attainment? I think you have to you have to go back and, and root cause every shortage departure. And I think you'll find some really, really interesting answers there. No, oh, great. So this is an interesting question. Um, if the supply planning team prefers that all demand is in the system, how can we convince them to do scenario planning without having to load the demand where the probability probability is unknown or or low? Um, 
the supply, to that plan team, the supply plan team wants to see all demand. Uh, um, sure, they should see all demand and then come out of the supply review with with uh, essentially a recommendation, a recommended supply plan. And I think we're sort of still being consistent inside of SNLP. But then you have then you have a potential constraint, and you have the uh, the inability to deliver. So you want to see everything. Say you can only deliver ninety percent, then you have to start making a decision about the ninety percent you'd serve. So again, one of, some of my consulting experience goes back to the chemical industry. They were they essentially had oversold lines, and so they'd want to see all demand, but they constrain the demand down to the items that were most profitable or had most strategic importance to the organization. Sometimes they're one and the same, sometimes they're not. And, and they would use, that, use the output of the supply review and elevate those as issues into the SNLP process. So you follow everything we sort of talk about. You get unconstrained demand going into the supply review. Supply review determines how to solve the problem or not. And then issues arising from that um, make it into the pre-SNOP process and then the, the SNOP executive review meeting. Great. So obviously, as, as I spoke to you earlier, I, I know there was going to be a question on technology. So I'm going to throw it out there. Um, yeah you know, not so much of the brands of technology that, that's being used, but what should one look for in a technology uh, that could help facilitate SNOP and, and mitigating risk um, and, and perhaps even forecasting, if you can share some of the sure. so, experience. So, so well-implemented, um, you know, exception-based demand planning solution, and there's, there's many good ones out there, so I don't, you know, we just went through a selection process here, and we found that there were there were many many companies that had very very similar traits and functionality. So I, I know that there's very good demand planning technology out there. Um, rough cut capacity planning, most of the time, I mean, sometimes you see it in in some random system that they have the capability to do it. It's one of those things that. A lot of times when people say they have an SNOP solution and I ask them to show me a rough cut capacity plan, they kind of fall short there. Um, uh, so there are people out there that are doing it. And I think it's a bit of a hunt and pack. You have to go find that. Network, network optimization, there's lots of people that have network optimization tools. For example, I, I'm not sure what Oracle calls it now, but uh, they bought the old new metrics links product, which I think they relabeled as SNO or SNOW. And I think they were offering that as a network optimization tool. Network optimization tool, by the way, are great supply chain modeling tools. And um, essentially it gives you, gives you the ability to solve on value. Uh, I mean, it's calculus, so it's a little bit more advanced than sort of average everyday supply chain planning. And it's certainly more, more strategic. Uh, in nature, but there are plenty of tools out there in that realm. So there's technology uh, all over the place. Yeah, I just have to identify what your need is. Yeah, no, great. Um, this could uh, this question it, it may require uh, could require a whole days of discussion, but uh, it's really the question is how do we forecast for new products or products with short life cycles? How do we determine their uh, probabilities. Is there any kind of direction to get people started um, yeah. in, in that area, Pat? Yeah. Um, uh, short life cycles and new products are 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 sort of the the biggest biggest solve out there. It's the biggest problem solve out there. So who's ever going through it? Whoever asked that question, I feel your pain. Um, you know, fashion industry has relatively short life cycle. Um, most most consumer electronics, phones, and the like have relatively short life cycle, and the people that support those um, also live in very short life cycles. Uh, the best the best uh, answer I can give you is to leverage maximum amount of information. And I think there's some 
some stuff that's out there that's emerging right now, right now. The predictive analytics is certainly allowing you to examine what's happened in the past and what the what, what the correlation factors were that help drive some success. So I think some of the answer in short life cycle exists in the um, upfront forecasting and the ability to look into predictive analytics engines and hopefully get a better answer. Um, uh, and then there's all the other uh, other methods you can go through, bottoms up processes, Delphi methods. There's all different types of methods around uh, new product forecasting is the bugaboo and the biggest problem is always with um, is always with, you know, short life cycle products. So the general suggestion I give is make your best guess, but create create an enormous range, and then do do the best demand sensing you possibly can. And again, I push people into predictive analytics tools. Again, there's a lot of them out there. But Pat, a lot of those tools uh, depend on obviously utilizing the quote quote right data um and sure. in this environment that we're in you know we have more sources of of, of data it, it, are there are there new di new data points that your organization is looking at to, to better plan particularly for new products or short life cycle products you know such as yeah. uh social data or um you know something unstructured that's out there whether it's audio or video or um, yeah. Has that been brought into discussions uh, yet? Any? Yeah. There's a lot of people out there that are trying to look at that stuff. Um, I, I still continue, continuously look for someone who could give me a use case where they've used it extensively. Yeah, there's social data out there. Um, and, and you can do a certain amount of social sensing. I, I'm not sure how much benefit that has. Because the problem when you're planning um, especially with short life cycle, is that the life cycle has come and gone before you even know about it. And your ability to react is very small. So really, the more you plan and the, more, the better idea you have of the potential up front, the better you can manage to it. Uh, you can sense on the back end. You can sense, you can sense pre-orders. I mean, some of the consumer electronics, there's a concept of pre-ordering. Certainly the same thing in the fashion industry. You can look at that. Um, and you can look at other factors that align to it. You know, maybe, you know, maybe red is the hot color this year, and and you can make last minute decisions to change to to red. Uh, to be honest with you, it is one of the toughest styles, and I've yet to see a comprehensive solution. So, I, I think it's a combination of creating creating engines on the back end to react as fast as you possibly can to the consumer experience once it happened. And then using predictive analytics on the front end, to understand what the levers are that drive demand and create demand. And the combination of the two becomes your solve. It makes sense. Also, getting buy-in and uh, getting attention, is there any uh, suggestions or approaches that you would suggest on how to present risks and opportunities in the executive review meeting? Anything you can share with the audience? Well, I, I think this slide, and if you want me to go back to it, I can. I think this slide, at the end of, at the end of a discussion, whether it's a product family discussion or a branded discussion, um, having a slide that lays out the risks and the opportunities on the demand side is very instructive. And then on the supply side, having something that's roughly like this, that models um, supply demand in the inventory, um, and then and talks about assumptions inside that data and what the risks and opportunity are, a great way to summarize uh, the supply risks and dangers that exist inside of uh, the executive review. So there's lots of different formats for, for discussing. I, I, I think I've done something similar to this, where I put up a rough cut capacity model in one or two executive reviews. I, I, I try to put up what data makes sense to put in front of that audience. Because I want them to be able to make a decision. 
inside of that. So I have to put up what I believe to be the multiple scenarios to help them get there. Great. And, and you know, Pat, from our conversations last, last year, and you, you brought it up in your session, you know, your company had to recalibrate due to the hurricanes last year, particularly in Puerto Rico, where generators were uh, had to had to be placed to run the plants was one thing, but keeping them from getting ripped off or stolen, uh, as you said, was an, was another. And I know you're a big guy and probably could have defended those generators single-handedly. Patrick is built like a lean football player, everyone. But do you feel your SNOP process was well established to minimize that risk or mitigate risk in that in that situation, or were there some lessons learned? Uh, and if so, you know what what were they? Uh, for me, for me, there's some amount of preparation. So we came out of, you know, we built a little extra inventory last year during the hurricane season, and I, I think, um, and maybe it's just me as I think about it as a supply chain planner. I see it a little bit more as a black swan event, like as a one-time event, and I, I think one of the things that's really kind of more important, and you know, people will talk about. You know what happens if a tornado hits hits a distribution center or a plant in the Midwest or or there's a fire in a plant somewhere. Um, usually, natural disasters impact infrastructure. So your plant may be up and running, and our plant was up and running in I think less than two weeks. We were actually making product really really quick. Um, so we recovered, but I think what happened in Puerto Rico as an example is that the infrastructure, the roads, the highways, the ports, the airports, so damaged that um, our planning around our, our plant was relatively small to the magnitude of the total problem. And the problem was, was not just us or the degree of hardness of that plant. It was, it was, um, the fact that the island got devastated. So uh, the courage of the Puerto Rican people in putting that island back together in such a short amount of time and people on our plant, they just, they did amazing things. And, and I, you know, I, I have peers that I talk to who have manufacturing plants in Puerto Rico and, and they've expressed the same thing that the, the um, the resoluteness and the the um, the grit and resiliency and determination that I think most of us saw was just absolutely amazing. So, absolutely. So, folks, ladies and gentlemen, we're at the tail end. If you want the slides for today's session, there will be an email that you'll get in about an hour with a quick short survey. And if you can complete that, that's where you make your request for the slides. Again, sorry that we ran out of time, but Pat will be in Chicago next month at the conference uh, to meet meet in person and hear more wisdom and thought leadership from him, as well as so many other pra great practitioners. Um, it's one of the largest SNOP conferences in, in the world. So if you're able to get to Chicago, we definitely recommend you be there. And if you've attended this webinar, obviously we have a discount to use this code that's written here. I wanna thank everyone for joining us uh, today for wherever you are in the world. Pat, thank you so much for sharing your your knowledge and experience with with our mem with our both members from both organizations. And again, we look forward to seeing you or having you at a next at, at another IBF or ASTM program. Thank you very much.